law is is important in the utilities world. Uh, just this year across the session, we've seen bills about rights of way and siting and uh, a lot of discussion by our colleagues in the Senate about those sorts of issues. Uh, and so I thought it was important that we get a grounding in property law. And uh, thanks to our ranking member, Representative Keither, uh, she reached out to Professor Burt Griggs from the Washburn University School of Law. Uh, go Ichabods, my alma mater. Um, and in the professor's uh, defense, he was not teaching there when they granted me a degree. So this is not his fault. Uh, but uh, I do want to welcome Professor Burt Griggs uh, to our committee. You should have just gotten a copy of his PowerPoint. He's going to give us kind of a high-level 101 overview of property law um, and uh, mostly focusing, I think, on, on mineral rights and those kinds of things. But we'll be able to talk to him about a little bit of whatever issues regarding property may be on your mind. Professor Griggs, thank you very much for being our guest this morning. Disagree with that. Okay. And how do I advance the PowerPoint? Okay. I can just signal to you. Okay. Um, okay. Well, let me tell you as they're loading the PowerPoint what I'd like to do today. I have about four dozen slides, basically about how incredibly awesome American property law is. Okay. And I, I'm not trying to be flip. If you look at what's going on across the world, whether it's in a relatively peaceful place such as Canada or places being torn asunder by war such as Ukraine, whether you're in a totalitarian regime, whether it's Russia, whether you're in something like Ukraine or Canada, generally speaking, there are not the sort of private property rights in mineral resources that we have in this country. And most of you probably know that, but I think Part of my job today is to emphasize really maybe obvious things that this committee should think about as it approaches certain problems in natural resources. The American property law system is a very flexible and very open-ended system. And that should be a signal to people that you in many ways are only limited by your own creativity in terms of thinking about property rights and conveyancing and dividing rights up and down. So what I would like to do today, if you could go to the next slide, please, is summarize three uh, basic things. The first thing is how we create a mineral interest. Uh, how we can establish a distinct mineral estate separate from the fee uh, or the land and mineral estate together. How we can create interest in an oil and gas lease and how uh, there may be restrictions on creations of certain of these interests. The second thing I'd like to talk about, and this may get at times a little bit complicated, I would urge you not to worry about it too much. I just feel duty bound to cover the main uh, property ownership interests uh, in uh, oil and gas uh, properties, undivided interests, divided interests, um, successive interests, and term interests. And finally, uh, because every property story ends in heartbreak, uh, the loss of mineral interests. It is possible to lose mineral interests. Uh, I'm not going to go into some of the jurisdictions outside of Kansas. I'm going to focus most of my comments today on Kansas, obviously. Just curious, how many members of the committee have been to law school other than the chair? <laughs> All right. How long did you last? Pretty long years. Yeah. Well. You know, Johnny Cash said the 10 longest years of his life were the two years he spent in the Air Force. Uh, most people feel that way about law school. <laughs> so if we can go to the next slide, please. First of all, as a lawyer, I need to give you three basic uh, legal lessons, uh, quoting some of my favorite law professors. The first is Dean Concanon. Don't think great thoughts. Read the damn statute. Okay. The legislature writes the rules. You guys write the rules. 
The highest order outside of the Constitution, of course, is the body of statutes concerning oil and gas law that you pass and consider. The second lesson is read the deed. What did the owner convey? Read the lease. What did the lessor, the owner of the mineral interest, lease to the lessee? and said, shouldn't really exist. But because there are so many hundreds of thousands of conveyances and leases that to give meaning to those terms. Another reason why there's this body of law is things have changed dramatically. In the 1920s, coal bed methane was banned. It was toxic. You couldn't sell it. Uh, so uh, a lease conveying a uh, coal deposit, courts found, include coal bed methane, because that's not marketable, but that's not part of the coal estate. Well, times obviously changed by the 1980s, 1990s, coal bed methane is very important. Uh, and suddenly we are dealing with a classic property problem. You have a conveyance, you have a lease conveying a certain interest in oil and gas, that because an oil and gas lease can last conceptually forever as long as there's production, I'll get to that later, you may have an active lease that's 70 years old. And so much has changed since that lease was uh, entered into. Courts then have to construe what the lease means in 2022 instead of what it may have meant in 1952. So it can be a very complicated area of the law. So. If I can go on to the next slide, uh, now that you've been warned, uh, this is what the chair was referring to. There is a famous analogy in property law, thinks about the fee estate um, as consisting of a bundle of sticks. If you own section 30 of uh, Black Wolf Township uh, in Ellsworth County, Kansas, and that is an undivided fee, then thanks to the miracles of American property law, you own everything from heaven to hell. This is classic oil and gas doctrine. You can then divide that into various pieces. You can take that bundle of rights and divide and parcel out sticks within that bundle. The crowning uh, product of American property law is the fee simple absolute. I'm not going to talk about it too much because you guys aren't law students. Basically, that's where you own everything. Physically, you own everything. Temporally, you own everything. You own it now, and you get to control who owns it later. You have monopolistic control over your property. Okay? And you can divide that in all sorts of ways. There are very few limits on the division of your fee simple absolute into subordinate property rights. A couple of them, I'm not going to um, detain you with this. This is the stuff of law students' nightmares, the rule against perpetuities. Uh, but it's a real problem. Uh, it can be a real problem in oil and gas uh, situations. And the rule against... Um, unreasonable restraints on alienation. Don't worry about that. These are common law rules. The statutes have stepped in to clarify them in many ways. So if I can go to the next slide um, and start talking about the mineral interest. Now, if you have a fee simple absolute, you own the minerals, but you can also convey 
an interest in the minerals separate from your interest in the surface of the land. This is going to be the most common conveyance I'm going to talk about uh, during my presentation. And what we generally refer to this separate interest as is the mineral interest. By the way, if you are not tracking, if I'm not being clear, please feel free to interrupt, okay? Uh, my students do that all the time. <clears throat> of course, they pay the law school. You guys aren't paying me. I just want to get that on the record. You're welcome to donate to the Ichabods. Uh, we're building a new law school. Okay, so. Professor Griggs, we yes. have a hand up from uh, Representative Esau. I think I'll sure. let her get her question in here since you've made the invitation. Representative Esau? I did not intend to have my hand up. I apologize. I'm just okay. listening. Okay. <laughs> Attentively. All right. Okay, so. By the miracle of severance, the owner of a fee simple absolute can create a distinct mineral estate. And this is basically how it would go. O conveys, quote, the oil, gas, and other minerals in and under Section 30, Black Wolf Township, Ellsworth County, Kansas, to A. O is the grantor. Uh, a is the grantee. Now, look what's just happened. They have cut the fee simple absolute into two pieces. A now owns the oil, gas, and whatever is encompassed by other minerals. There are thousands of cases over what other minerals means, uh, plus an implied right to make use of the surface. I'll come back to that, okay? O owns the surface and the minerals that are not conveyed to A. And I'll come back to that. Next slide, please. You can see this in the mineral deed, okay? Um, where O would grant A all the oil, gas, and, and this is something that will be more a little more carefully drafted, okay? Oil, gas, including gas produced in migrating uh, coal seams, similar hydrocarbon substances, carbon dioxide, hydrogen, and helium, where in Kansas, uh, the helium conveyance is important, right? Uh, and all constituent substances extracted with the granted substances in and under the following land. So that's another common sort of conveyance uh, language. Next slide, please. So this is very important. The mineral estate is dominant over the surface estate. I owned Section 30 of uh, the township in Black, in Black Wolf Township. I conveyed, it to, I conveyed the mineral estate to the chair. We now own stuff in the same section. Our relationship is now permanently an issue, okay? The important thing to keep in mind here is that the mineral estate is dominant. What that means is I have retained the right to the use of the surface. Let's say I'm a farmer or a rancher and I need the surface use for stock matters. Maybe I've got some center pivots, something like that. But because the mineral estate is dominant, the chair has the right to come on to my property and explore and test and develop an oil and gas uh, uh, operation out of that. Okay. Why is that the case? Is it because the legislature picked winners and losers way back, you know, in the 19th century? No. It's just a simple act of judicial reasoning. If the chair cannot access the property to get oil and gas, his property is worthless. Okay. So the owner of a mineral estate under oil and gas law is dominant over the surface estate. However, there is a common law rule known as the accommodation doctrine. I have been farming and ranching on this section. I severed the mineral estate. The owner of the mineral estate must accommodate the activities that I'm pursuing on my uh, farm or ranch and cannot interfere with those. So a classic case is, if I've got a center pivot 
in the southeast corner of this section. They can't come in and drill and interrupt the ability of my farm operation to irrigate that ground. Okay. What should we do? Think of the t-shirt, put it in the lease. Okay. The accommodation doctrine is a product of the common law where the court has to set up rules of equity on how to balance the interests of these owners. But if we were careful, if we hired good lawyers, what do you want to convey? Do you want to convey the helium or not? Maybe you just want to convey the oil. Do you want to convey the oil and the gas? Maybe just the gas. It's my right as the owner of the fee simple absolute to convey whatever I want. And then a matter of our negotiations to see what does the chair want? What does the chair need? They'll probably want oil and gas because they're so frequently mixed, right? So the mineral estate is dominant, but the parties, the surface estate and the mineral owner, they've got to accommodate each other, especially the mineral estate has to accommodate the surface. Okay. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so creating interests from the fee or mineral interest. What I've talked about so far are where our situations where you own a permanent real possessory right to something to the surface or to the mineral estate but the coin of the realm in oil and gas law is the oil and gas lease a lot of oil and gas companies never drill for oil they're basically in the real estate business they're in the business of marketing and consolidating and parceling out leases and so the longest chapter of my oil and gas case book, which I inherited from my esteemed predecessor, David Pierce, is chapter three, the oil and gas lease. Because there are so many things that can go wrong in the drafting and the construction of an oil and gas lease. But very basic, very basic rules here. The owner of the mineral estate is the lessor, the person who has the property and can enter into a lease. The lessee is typically the oil and gas company that leases the mineral estate from the lessor. In Kansas, this lease uh, is a non-possessory interest. It's personal property. I don't want to get too much into the weeds on this, but I've already created three different types of property interests, and I've only been talking for about eight or ten minutes. There's the fee simple absolute, heaven to hell. There's the mineral estate, which is whatever I've granted to the chair in terms of his right to extract oil, gas, and other minerals in and under Section 30. The chair then can lease his mineral estate to an oil and gas company who can lease it and produce um, oil and gas. So next slide, please. This is where the chair holds so much power under the magic and the alchemy of American property law. The chair can develop the mineral interest himself. Um, most Owners, uh, well, many owners uh, choose not to do that. Uh, they would rather lease it, okay? And it's more common for the owner of the mineral estate to lease that mineral estate, <clears throat> typically to an oil and gas company. What rights does the mineral owner have? Well, they have basically five rights. They have the right to lease. That's known as the executive right. This is one of the most important rights in an oil and gas lease. Who actually has the power to lease the ground? Uh, if the chair leases the ground to <clears throat> Pierce Oil Company, uh, the chair will get typically a bonus payment, uh, similar to a signing bonus in sports, uh, for signing the lease. And oftentimes that bonus payment is, pro, is, is uh, rated according to the acreage of the lease. So let's say he wants to lease the whole section. So, you know, $2,000 uh, an acre, uh, he would get 640 acres times two. Okay. So there's the right to lease. There's the right to collect bonus payments. 
if the oil and gas company is not uh, eager to develop and the lease allows the oil and gas company to postpone development, <clears throat> the oil and gas owner, the mineral owner, can receive delay rentals. Likewise, they can, they can get shut-in royalties. Maybe they're producing oil and gas for a while, but they decide to shut in the well for a year or two. If the lease provides for that, then the oil and gas lessor gets uh, shut-in royalties under that. But what do we really want to talk about here? Why is it always so much fun to go to Hugoton in the spring and go to the Southwest Kansas Royalty Owners Association? The mineral owner wants royalties. Okay? And the mineral owner gets generally pretty substantial share of production. Standard default fraction is one-eighth. And the royalty mineral owner leasing to the lessee gets that free of the costs of production. The oil and gas company shoulders the cost of production. In most oil and gas leases, the lessor takes the royalty free of the cost of production. And I'll come back to this uh, occasionally uh, for the remainder of my presentation. So if I go to the next slide, a common lease structure. I'll be repeating myself uh, a little bit here. Thank you. Okay. An oil and gas lease is generally broken up into two periods. This is where we get division in time, okay? We've already divided in space between the fee and the mineral estate. Now we have our first division in time. Standard oil and gas lease, and most of these are badly written, okay? If you are, if you guys are landowners and you're presented with a form lease, don't sign it. Professor Pierce said, using a form lease is legal malpractice. And I think he's convinced me. It's taken a couple years, but I think he's right. Take it to your lawyer. Okay? And this is not an ad to go hire a lawyer. It's an ad to hire a lawyer for a lot less money now than it's going to take later. Okay? 411 is always a cheaper call than 911. Always. Okay? There are a lot of crappy lease forms out there. Landmen use them all the time. Company gave them the lease. A lot of language in there that's illegal and totally inapplicable in Kansas. Does the landowner know that? No. Does an oil and gas lawyer know that? Yes. Okay. And uh, no, it's not going to be the end of my pitch. I'm going to have a couple more pitches throughout this presentation. But <clears throat> an oil and gas lease is divided into two general time periods. First time period is called the primary term. That is a period generally between three and five years where the lessor grants to the lessee an exclusive right to explore, develop, and produce minerals from the property. During that period, it's basically an exclusive option. But at some point, if there is not production, let's say it's a five-year primary term, and there's no production from Section 30 in that five years, the lease terminates. So in many oil and gas cases, this is the fact pattern. January 1st, 2017, oil and gas lease is executed. Great. People get bonus rentals to go to the dealership, buy a new truck, etc. Nothing happens for five years. And then in December 2021, Suddenly, the oil and gas company gets interested. They start developing the lease. The question in this situation is, has there been production or something relevant to production by the end of that five-year term? If there has, then that production kicks the lease into the next period of the lease, which is called the secondary term. And in that situation, if you have production within the primary term, the lease is then held by production. And all of these terms have been litigated. Okay? What does production mean? What does production and paying quantities mean? 
okay? If you have a lease that is old and is obsolete, but is still the lease that governs the relationship between the parties, you have a lot of pitfalls here, okay? But as I said, the distribution of risk is pretty straightforward. The lessee develops the lease, and if after uh, all of the investment involved in producing oil and gas and selling it and paying the royalty to the landowner, they are in the black, they make money. The royalty owner doesn't care. They don't want to hear about the labor pains. They just want to see the baby. Okay? They get one-eighth of all revenue free of the cost of production. So there are situations where the lessee, let's say the lessee got a million dollars in revenue from that oil and gas lease for 2021. But it costs $900,000 to get that million dollars of oil out of the ground. You might think, well, that's okay, because the oil and gas guys, they made a hundred grand. No. They made a million dollars gross, but what do they have to pay the landowner? Mr. Chair gets a check for $125,000. One eighth of revenues free of the cost of production. Okay, that means the oil company is now looking at $875,000 after paying the landowner's royalty. How much did it cost to develop that oil and gas lease for that year? $900,000. Oil and gas companies on the red. The chairman doesn't care. He's got $125,000. He has executed the hard work of walking to the mailbox every quarter and getting that check, okay? So the distribution of risk between lessees and lessors explains why there's so much litigation between these parties. Next, next uh, slide, please. Okay, uh, another sort of pause to remember a couple things. Oil and gas development is very expensive. It's very capital intensive. It's highly regulated. You can walk on to just about any oil and gas lease in the state, and I tell my law students, this is really kind of a good practice. You should do this. You get to know your clients, you get to know the operations. Also, you're probably going to discover eight or 12 violations of various federal environmental laws. Not because your client is a bad operator, but because there are so many laws regulating oil and gas. Okay. <clears throat> the longest chapter, second longest maybe in the oil and gas case book is the environmental regulation of oil and gas. It's a very regulated industry. So, a lot of oil and gas companies out there, and in Kansas, we are mostly dominated by independent oil and gas companies who do not have the capital uh, and the, the cash resources to just pay for the stuff they need. And this is where American property law comes into the, uh, it comes into play again. Instead of paying, for example, a drilling company, $400,000 to pour the concrete pad and spud the well and get the well into a producing uh, zone and start producing oil, they might assign or convey a partial interest in what the lessee owns. This is the fourth stage of division, right? We started with the fee, then we went to the fee in the mineral estate, then the mineral estate lease to the lessee. Now the lessee can divide interest under the lease. I'll give you a share of production, a share of something. I'll give you a royalty on top of the landowner's royalty in exchange for you building something, building a road, uh, supplying water, uh, that sort of thing. <clears throat> and both lessees and lessors can divide their interests. The chair, at some point, we all die. The chair will have heirs. The chair's heirs will have heirs. You can have a lease that's 50 to 60 years old and that property has been subdivided maybe 64 different ways. It doesn't take long to have a lot of interests in an oil and gas property. So let's get into some nitty gritty here. And I'm going to go a little quickly here. If I lose you, 
I'm happy to slow down, but some of this stuff is more oriented towards a, a law student audience uh, because I, I felt like I should err on the side of completeness. So next slide, please. First thing I want to talk about is what's called a non-participating royalty interest. This is created by the chair. I'm going to pick on you a lot, but the good news is you get to go to the mailbox four times a year. Okay. Um, <clears throat> this is created by the mineral owner. It is a way to convey an interest, interest in the mineral estate. But the chair does not want to give up control. So the chair can create what we call a non-participating interest. Does not have control in terms of leasing, but can get a share of the revenue. And in a situation like this, where you're creating a non-participating royalty interest, two common ways to, to form it are, uh, the first way would be O grants to A the right to receive one half of the royalty provided for in any oil and gas lease covering the following land, Section 30, Black Wolf Township, Ellsworth County. What does that mean? Well, the chair, who's my client, just did something terribly foolish. Like he conveyed like half his royalties away. He can do that, though. He's in love. Yeah. Or, you know, he's, he's facing a bad crop or something like that. All sorts of reasons why people make bad business decisions. Okay. So in that situation, he conveyed a right to half of the royalties. So he gets a one-eighth, but someone else gets the other, gets half of that one-eighth, so now he's just split it, one-sixteenth, one-sixteenth. But he has not, to his credit, given up the right to lease the ground. Okay? Next slide, please. <clears throat> so that's a non-participating royalty interest. There's also something called a non-participating mineral interest. This is one of the favorite ways that I uh, get my students to get questions on the multiple choice exam wrong. It's very hard to distinguish a non-participating royalty interest from a non-participating mineral interest. Remember what the chair has. The chair, as the owner of the mineral estate, has the right to develop himself, chose not to do that. He's got a right to sign the lease, the executive right. He's got the right to get a bonus for that, get delayed rentals, get shut-in royalties, most importantly, get a royalty. All of these components can be divided. You can divide the living daylights out of oil and gas properties. Okay, if he were particularly foolish, if you wanted to guarantee full employment for probably five to 10 lawyers, he would convey each of these to one of his dear children. And I'm sure they would get along just fine. Okay, as oil gets to $200 a barrel, um, as opposed to a year ago when it was negative. Okay, I mean, this is another thing to think about with oil and gas. I mean, it is not for the weak hearted. Uh, the price fluctuations and the risks are uh, extraordinary. So, next slide, please. This is how um, you could do it. You could, you could extend a non-participating mineral interest as opposed to a non-participating royalty interest the following way. Well, I'm going to convey to you the mineral uh, estate, but I'm going to keep a lot of stuff for myself. Okay, I'm going to keep all rights to develop the executive right. I'm going to keep all rights to get a bonus. Um, I'm going to keep all rights to get delay rentals. So what does that mean? Next slide. The net effect is it can be very difficult to distinguish between a non-participating mineral interest and a non-participating royalty interest that conveys the right to receive royalty under an oil and gas lease. Why is that important? Why am I burning your valuable time? Because one often is tied to a lease. Leases can be lost. They can ab be abandoned. They can be forfeited. Land cannot. Okay. So there are legal rules that can engage 
and cancel out a royalty interest, they do not cancel out a mineral estate. Okay, next slide. I'm going to start using some, some other examples here. How we can create other interests in the oil and gas lease. I already mentioned this. We can transfer, uh, the lessor can transfer things by assigning royalty income. I've talked about that. Next slide, please. The lessee, the oil company, can also convey things out of its leasehold. Remember what a leasehold is. It's the ownership of that property during the term of the lease. So the oil company, it can convey additional royalties. It already has the burden of a one eighth royalty to the chair. It can convey a royalty interest. It's similar to a landowner's royalty, or it can convey what's called a working interest. This is where you basically become a partner sharing in the risk and rewards of the developer. So you'll see terms, the term called working interest. That's what that means. Next slide, please. Another wet thing you can create in an oil and gas lease is what's called an overriding royalty. This is something that is created by the lessee. And under my uh, hypothetical language, the Acme Oil Company assigns to A, the right to receive one sixteenth of all the oil, gas, and other minerals produced under the lease between O and Acme Oil Company covering the following land. So here you have the lessee carving out interests within its own interest. Next slide. You can also convey what's called a production payment. You can assign an interest in the lease until it hits a certain monetary level. I might give you a 164th interest in my lease, and we've got revenue, and once you've got $50,000 in gross receipts from that, then you're out. Why is that beautiful? We can make a deal without my having to write you a check for $50,000. Okay, next slide, please. You can also do a net profits interest. Uh, this can get pretty inside baseball pretty fast, but in that situation, you are signing over, not your gross, but your net. Okay, and next slide. You always want to define what the heck net profits means. Do you want to submit your life and the trust funds of your children to what a court will find net profits to be. Put that in the lease, okay? Next slide. <clears throat> you can also have what's called a carried interest. This is basically where the owner of the development rights, the lessee, the person who has uh, the right to make decisions on the lease, agrees to, quote, carry the owner of the carried interest to a specified point. You don't have to pay for leasing the ground. You don't have to pay for sputting the well. You don't have to pay for getting the gas hooked up to a pipeline, so on and so forth. Uh, but then the carrying party recovers those costs at some later point. So if you're getting a sense that this is about relationships, you're absolutely right, okay? Property law is all about relationships. Everything I've described so far, everybody I've mentioned owns something. But their ownership interests are related to what other people own. And I'll come back to that. Next slide. Restrictions on the freedom to create mineral interests. Um, I mentioned this earlier. There's this thing called the rule against perpetuity. American property law allows you to rule from the grave. It's astounding, right? I can basically permanently determine the fate of my property during my lifetime. Property is going to be there for thousands of years after I die, but I can make fundamental changes to it now. However, the law over the last couple hundred years has put limits on to whom I can convey the land. If it is too conditional, if, it is too, if it's too far out, if it's too uncertain, then the courts can uh, 
basically nullify that conveyance. That could be an entire two hour lecture. I'm not going to, I'm not going to burden you with that today, but think about why that, why I'm raising this. The reason I'm raising this is an oil and gas lease hypothetically can last forever. Remember if it's held by production, go drive up, you know, from Greenwood County up to Emporia, there are oil and gas leases in that part of the state that have been in production since the 20s and the 30s, the 1920s, okay? So it is a real deal in the oil and gas world where if there is some owner of a future interest in an oil and gas lease, it could violate the rule. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> Now I'm going to get into some patterns, some divisions in place. We've talked about some of the basic things, right? The fee, the mineral estate, the owner of the mineral estate then executes a lease. The lessor can carve out interests on the lessor side. The lessee can carve out interests on the lessee's side. God bless America. Okay. And we can also have undivided interests. I uh, hereby uh, will to my beloved children, each of which will receive an undivided one-third interest in the oil and gas property I own. My children now have, they're now co-tenants of the mineral estate. Okay. Uh, and in my mineral deed, O grants to A an undivided 50% interest in all the oil, gas, and similar hydrocarbons. So there's that, that situation would be that's outside of the, the world of a will uh, or of a trust. But if O conveys, conveys to A half of that, then O and A are now co-tenants. There's not some line in the mineral estate between O and A. They owe an undivided interest. Next slide, please. And there are two major issues here. Who can authorize development? talked about an executive right earlier. If the conveyance is silent on this, you are begging for a lawsuit. Oh, we'll work it out later. Just sign it. You know, we need to go to the restaurant. It's Thanksgiving. 411 is always cheaper than 911. Okay. Who has the right to actually lease the ground? And how are you going to share proceeds? Next slide, please. If you have undivided interest, the majority rule is the right of a co-tenant. You have all the rights as if you owned everything. You have the right to develop it. You have the right to lease. However, if you do that, then the courts have held you have a right, you have a duty to account to the other co-tenants for their share of the proceeds. Next slide. Then we get into divided interests. These are quite common. Instead of just conveying an undivided interest in section 30, the parties can be more specific. Uh, I'm just going to convey uh, the mineral estate in the northeast quarter, those 160 acres. Uh, or I'm going to give you even less of an amount. I will give you an undivided 10% interest in the Northeast quarter. Well, congratulations, right? Now you've got an undivided interest within a divided interest. You're all still awake. This is awesome. Okay. <clears throat> this is why oil and gas companies hire accountants, right? They have a duty to make an accounting for all these things when the royalties come due, okay? So you can have surface boundary divisions, that is the default way, but you can also have subsurface boundary divisions according to the depth of the deposit. Some oil and gas formations are shallower, some are deeper, just like with aquifers, the Ogallala is a shallower aquifer than the Dakota. You can have an oil and gas lease uh, that refers to a specific geological formation. The Mississippi Lime Formation. 
I'm going to convey a lease or I'm going to convey an interest to uh, an undivided 50% interest in the Mississippian lime formation beneath section 30. Um, and you can also divide by substance. The classic phrase is oil, gas, and other minerals. Water is not a mineral. Nice try. People have tried that, okay, claiming water under an oil and gas lease. People have tried to claim coal bed methane under a coal lease. I mentioned that earlier. Generally, that hasn't worked under older leases. Helium is a big deal. Helium's not a hydrocarbon, but it's a gas, it's a mineral. Do you want to subject the rest of your walking to the mailbox life to a phrase as vague as oil, gas, and other minerals? No, you want to be as specific as you can. The problem is no matter how smart the chair is, no matter how much he knows about oil and gas, he can't predict the future. Certain things become really valuable that were worthless decades ago. Coal bed methane is a good example. Another really good example, uranium. People would claim uranium as another mineral under one of these conveyances. And generally they failed. Okay. Helium, the biggest one right now is lithium. Areas of the American West, which we thought were nothing but wastelands, and on top of that, super fun sites like the Salton Sea in Southern California, there's a lot of lithium in the Salton Sea. Suddenly people are like going back to their old leases and saying, well, do I own that stuff? Because Elon Musk would be interested. Panasonic Battery Company, which has that big plant up in Reno, uh, would be interested. Representative Berquist, you have a question? Uh, diamonds, gemstones, and silica. Are they under a whole different set of laws? Uh, put it in the lease. Uh, if you are in uh, a, a if you're on private land, you're, you're going to be out of luck. If, you, if, it's, a, if it's a lease uh, from the United States, uh, Forest Service land or Bureau of Land Management land, you're going to be out of luck. There was a famous case in California on silica, where guess what the guy was trying to cl claim? Beachfront property on a lake. Yeah, it's really valuable as real property for a condominium. It's not real property for the purposes of an oil and gas conveyance. conveyance. So... People who have claimed things outside of the hydrocarbon space have not generally been all that successful. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank yeah, you. it's a great question. Okay. But if you wanted to, put it in the lease, right? I give you oil, gas, and other minerals, including silica. Okay. In Kansas, I could not convey water rights because water rights are granted by the state. I could grant you a water right, but not water itself. Okay. So this gets to other areas of the law. And I think one of the good things this committee is doing is thinking about these issues across resources. It's not just oil and gas, uh, it's other things as well. Okay, I wanna keep charging here. Um, next slide, please. We're gonna go back to divisions in time, successive interests, a classic conveyance, especially in farm country and a terrible idea is the life estate and the remainder. It's common in farm country where the spouse may wanna have, make sure the spouse stays on the farm, or stays on the property during his or her life. And once they die, someone gets the remainder. But there are all sorts of issues with this <clears throat> that we can talk about outside of this room. I'll probably use profanity, okay? It's a terrible idea, but look what we've just done. We have now put more people into the conveying pot. I convey my property, I give a life estate to my wife. Remainder to the heirs. I don't know who the heirs are. You can change your heirs until the time you croak, right? But I die. I'm out of the picture. My wife now owns the life estate. What does that mean? She owns the property until she dies. The only thing she can sell is any interest in that property while she's alive. That's why it's called the life estate. People who own the big thing, the remainder, because we all die and the kids are just, they're mouth watering. They're waiting to buy that condo in Scottsdale. As soon as that woman goes, boom, we're auctioning it off, okay? But in the meantime, <clears throat> 
You can say I don't teach property law. They, they don't trust me with that. <clears throat> I mean, family law. They trust me with property law. Um, who can authorize development? This is the classic case, right? You might have a big farm, like 20 sections, and it's under a life estate and a remainder. And now we've got $200 a barrel oil. Well, the widow or the widower wants a piece of that. The owners of the remainder are itching for someone to have an accident, perhaps. Okay. This is a really hot, uh, potentially hot issue. Okay. How do you share the proceeds? The basic rule, next slide, is that neither the life tenants nor the owner or owners of the remainder can do this on their own. Unless, of course, it's in the conveyance to the owner of the life estate. If I convey to my wife a life estate with the right to develop oil and gas, comma, remainder to our kids or to my wife's heirs, then the conveyance made it clear. Okay, but if there's no language in the conveyance to that, then you have an issue. Next slide, please. Once you've got development, a series of rules will determine who shares in those proceeds. Unless, of course, you have put it in the document. Unless you have called 411 and a lawyer has advised you of these issues, say, look, this could come up in the next 15 or 20 or 50 years. Let's address it now. Okay? And that's part of your power as the owner. You can determine the destiny of the, owner, of the property you own. So next slide, please. <clears throat> Under a concept called the open mine doctrine, which applies beautifully to oil and gas because we're mining stuff out of the ground. Under my hypothetical, where I convey a life estate to my wife, uh, remainder two of the heirs, if our ground is under lease at that time, then the life estate owner, my wife, gets all the lease benefits. Without a lease in effect at the time, then things can get carved up all sorts of ways. Next slide. I don't want to even get into this. It's too inside baseball for the purposes of today's talk. A very smart thing to do is to hold things in trust. One of the great things about trust is trusts never die, which means they're often insulated from the uh, problems of, of rules against perpetuity problems, long-term problems. So the trust agreement would control the development. Absent that, you look to statutes. Uh, in Kansas, we have statutes that assign how um, revenue is divided uh, between a, a life owner and the owner of a remainder. Uh, next slide, please. Some other interests that uh, we can make in time. The owner of the mineral estate can assign a royalty interest to someone for a period of years. You get royalties for 10 years. I would advise him to do that. If you are stupid enough to give away royalties, at least be less stupid. Only assign 10 years of it, not forever. But maybe he's got a Camaro problem. Maybe he owns a dealership, a lot of money. He needs to sell everything. You know, that's not my problem. That's the client's problem, okay? Uh, farm leases are often year to year. They are often oral. That's a good example of a term interest. But you also have what's called a defeasible term interest. And I mentioned that with an oil and gas lease, right? It has a primary term. It can go away without production. It can last as long as there is production in the secondary term. So there are term interests, there are defeasible term interests. Uh, next slide, please. And I'm repeating myself a little bit. This is the defeasible term mineral interest where O grants to A an interest so long as oil and gas is produced, right? If the oil and gas company goes away, there's no more production, the, the, the well is capped, that interest goes away right there. Next slide. Common problem with this is creditors. Who gets what? 
is also something that, you know, people in the oil and gas industry have to think about because of the common presence of, of mortgages, of liens, uh, subordination, subrogation, uh, all of those things can come into play. Next slide. Finally, there are interests. <clears throat> I shouldn't say finally. That's when my students pack up to leave. I'm getting there. Okay, I probably got about five minutes. Um, there can be a relationship between the lessor of a mineral interest and the lessee of the mineral interest in Section 30. But Section 30 can be burdened with all sorts of other things. There can be a public easement. There may be a county road crossing Section 30. There may be private easements. Okay? All of these create relationships and networks that complicate the operation of the oil and gas lease. Do the rights conflict? Do they, can they coexist? You generally want to try and make them coexist if possible. Next slide, please. Now, how can we lose these? This is the sad part of the story. <clears throat> My youngest child has been trying to adversely possess property across the street for a while. I keep telling him it's not going to work, but hope springs eternal. Adverse possession. How many of you are familiar with this concept? The people who attended law school. Excellent. Okay. Adverse possession is a scary but sensible thing. At some point, if you stop acting like an owner, the law will start removing protections that you have to protect what you own. I own Section 30. It's a beautiful piece of ground in Ellsworth County. But I go to Paris. I haven't been to Kansas in 15 years. Meanwhile, someone's come along. We'll call that person the chair. Has fenced off the ground. Has put cattle on the ground has actually succeeded somehow in paying taxes on it. Everyone knows that the chair is, is living in Section 30. He's got a double wide there. He's got cattle. He's got stock ponds. I come back from my 20-year vacation in Paris. I say, Mr. Chair, with all due respect, get the hell off my property. And he's not budging. We call the sheriff. I file a lawsuit called an ejectment action. Get the chair off of my land. He files a counterclaim. I have obtained title to Section 30 by adverse possession. What does that really mean? What adverse possession really means, it's a statute of limitation. After 15 years, if someone is acting like an owner on your ground and you've not done anything for 15 years, the court is not going to grant you the right to eject the trespasser from the ground. Okay, that is adverse possession in a nutshell. Happy to take questions later, okay? Statutes strictly govern this in terms of statutes of limitations, right? A statute of limitations, how long can you bring an action in court for a certain wrong? I'm trying to bring a trespass action. The, the Kansas statute gives me 15 years, okay? You can lose interest in oil and gas by adverse possession. And here are some examples, okay? Let's say I'm the fee owner. I own everything from heaven to hell. I've not severed the interest in the mineral estate yet. But under my hypothetical, if the chair obtains my ground from adverse possession, my ground is undivided, right? He also got the mineral estate. Because the, the, the estate, in my hypothetical, has not been divided, okay? But let's say I had divided the mineral estate, okay? That I had conveyed the mineral estate to Representative Carmichael. He now owns the mineral estate, all the oil, gas, and other minerals in and under Section 30. I'm the surface owner, but I'm in Paris. Along comes um, the average possessor, the chair, and starts drilling a well. Starts doing other things. Can he obtain Representative Carmichael's mineral estate by adverse possession? That can be a harder 
question. But generally speaking, if he's coming onto the surface and just running cattle and has a double wide, everyone knows him. He's loved in the community. Okay. <laughs> he did not succeed in adversely possessing Representative Carmichael's mineral state. Is he's only his conduct is limited to conduct on the surface. Okay, next slide. This is one of my favorite things to talk about. I got to stop. It's a bad habit, adverse possession. Okay, abandonment. I can abandon this watch. It's personal property. Generally speaking, the law does not allow you to abandon real property. That offends Lord Blackstone. That offends uh, the courts of equity and property. Uh, going way back to the medieval period. So, the issue of whether you can abandon a property in oil and gas hinges on what sort of property it is. If I tell my property students, the first step is always try and characterize the property interest. What does the client actually own? Okay. If the jurisdiction thinks of the oil and gas interest, as a real property interest, then you cannot have abandonment. And that would be the rule in Kansas. But if you're in what I call a Merle Haggard jurisdiction, Oklahoma or California, you can conceivably abandon that because that those courts view those interests as uh, non real uh, as, 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 as personal or, or not real property. Regardless though, leases can be abandoned. Okay. And leases are abandoned all the time. That's one of the reasons we have so many orphan well problems, right? People walk away. Okay. Um, next slide, please. Kansas legislature has spoken to some of this in dormant mineral acts. One of the problems is I'm an oil and gas company. I'm trying to lease ground from the chair who had nine kids and they had each had three kids. So we've got like nine plus 27 plus spouses plus nine. We got 36 potential owners. I've found 34 of them, but there are two out there that I haven't found. And I don't want to lease this ground. I can't really issue a solid title opinion on this ground until I got 36 to 36. Okay. Maybe I can't find them. In this situation, the legislature has stepped in and said, look, owners have a duty to make themselves known. And if they don't make themselves known, then the state can collapse those interests. And there are two basic forms of this. One is where the law automatically terminates a mineral interest and reunites them with the surface interest if you don't follow uh, the rules for a specific period of time. And that's what Indiana does. That case went all the way to the Supreme Court because, of course, the people who had lost their interest argued that the government had taken their property. And the Supreme Court said, no, this is not a takings. The owners were noticed up. We have statutes of limitations for a reason. This is a well-established principle in property law and an Indiana statute. We're going to uphold this state law as not violating the Constitution. Kansas learned from that and has more of a two-step process, and I'll summarize it. Basically, if you own a mineral and gas interest uh, and someone wants to develop it, the person who wants the, the, the company that wants to develop it has the duty to notify you. And then you're on notice. And you have a certain amount of time to file a statement of claim. And if you file that statement of claim, you're fine. You're totally protected. And in that situation, uh, a gentleman, one of my favorite names in oil and gas law, Cleve Buford Overall was his name. Uh, he followed the statutes exactly. He protected his mineral state under the Kansas statutes and the oil company who wanted to have his interest collapsed lost. All right, the last two slides, I'm gonna go maybe a little more slowly to talk about how oil and gas concepts speak to two of the more important issues in Kansas. One is renewable energy. With wind, generally, wind rights are not severable. 
in the way that oil and gas rights are, okay? And this is something that I am going to ask to put off for a later talk if you want to get into that. But I've talked about the magic of severance in oil and gas. Wind, because it's a much more, much newer area of the law, uh, is following separate rules and for very good reasons. Texas has decided foolishly that wind rights should be severable. That was not a good call. But many times uh, the general lesson is don't look to Texas for real property guidance. Okay. Um, that said, we know how oil and gas properties work. Landowners, energy companies, land men, the people and men and women actually go out and lease properties are familiar with the basic concepts of oil and gas. It's what they're trained in. So the general things I've talked about in terms of royalties, in terms of interests, can apply. Okay, uh, you know, baseball is a vast improvement on cricket. Okay, bluegrass is a vast improvement over Irish folk music. I probably lost some friends just now saying that. Okay, but you understand the structure of the older form, it helps you understand the newer one. Okay, and so... There are many farmers out there who have signed wind leases where they get royalties or perhaps the lease provides for cash payments with accelerated payments, you know, accelerated schedules for inflation and that's sort of those sort of things. But keep in mind what I've said at least 50 million times by now. Read the lease. If you are owning, the, if you are the owner of the fee simple absolute, if you're the owner of the surface, then you have the right to sign the lease. You have the right to negotiate the terms that make sense for you. And the lease will control almost always. If the lease is unclear or ambiguous, that's when the courts get involved. Okay? And also read the statutes. Next slide, second to last slide. Uh, something that's very important and will only become more important it's carbon capture, <clears throat> use and storage. Now we're taking all of these property concepts that have developed over the last 150 years in oil and gas, and we're reversing them, right? We want this stuff underground, but the stuff is poor space. The stuff are geological substrates that can hold injected carbon dioxide or that can hold injected methane, other greenhouse gases. Well, okay, then assume the following. We have a typical conveyance of a mineral interest, O to A. I've conveyed to the chair all of the oil, gas, and other minerals to, uh, in and under section 30. What does the chair own? The chair owns the mineral estate. But what is that? Carbon capture is bringing new scrutiny on that question. Okay? Basically, what courts have held so far is that the owner of the surface owns the right to the poor space. The owner of the mineral estate does not. Why? Because the mineral estate is the right to extract oil, gas, and other minerals. It's a right to extract. But the landowner, the surface owner, who owns the geological substrate, owns that poor space. And I've, I've identified a really great case out of Texas, Lightning v. Anadarko, where the court held that. Watch this space, okay? This is the sort of area that I'm sure your committee is interested in. And so with that, I'll go to my next slide. If you have any questions, this is the guy you want to contact. Uh, <clears throat> but he'd be mad at me. He is very retired. Uh, that's my, uh, my email contact if you want to get in touch. But I'll take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Questions? Representative Turner. Say, so in your, uh, thank you for your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, in your scenario of, a, of adverse possession, was, uh, was Mr. Carmichael or Representative Carmichael renting the property? No, he owned it. 
he, oh, he owned it. Was he paying yeah. rent to so, the so owner? That was, or there, that was a severance under my hypothetical. But you, if you want to give me a different hypothetical, we can, we can dance with that. So under my conveyance, um, let's say the chair owned everything in fee. No, I owned everything in fee, and I conveyed the mineral estate to Representative Car Carmichael through a deed. So I, he, he is the owner. He is not the lessee. He is the owner of the mineral estate. I thought he was just occupying the land in some fashion while he was in Paris was the scenario, right? I think the chair had occupied my land. Okay. Was he paying you rent when he occupied the land while you were gone? Nope. He was just a low-down trespasser. Okay. That's what I wasn't clear yeah. on. Thank you. Thank no you. No problem. Yeah, adverse possession is kind of slow motion piracy. <laughs> so, if you're if you're looking for uh, an analog, Representative Delperdang. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A couple questions, if I may. Um, I guess legal issues to look at upon inheriting a portion of ground, if there would be ground damage, leakage, spillage, etc. What? Essentially, could a person inherit a huge liability coming in there? What? What are you asking for, a friend? Yeah, asking for a friend. <laughs> yeah, but but then what? What yeah. steps would a, would you recommend taking as that happens? Under federal environmental law, you have cradle to grave liability for environmental pollution under uh, under the rules of of CERCLA, um, the, the Superfund Act. Um, and so liability is a very serious issue in the development of oil and gas properties. So a, a lease or a conveyance can convey many things, but the issue of trying to convey or keep liability for something, federal environmental law saw that coming a long time ago. And starting in the seven, 1970s, they wouldn't allow that by law. So you and I could have an agreement, for example, where I, where I sell my oil and gas property to you and there's all sorts of pollution issues. And obviously you're only gonna buy it if I absorb all of the liability for cleanup. Well, there are gonna be federal obstacles to that um, under various statutes. Some you may be able to, you know, a typical oil and gas lease, you have a right to the reasonable use of the surface so generally the rule is you can mess it up oil and gas is messy but when we're finished you gotta you know take your stuff out you gotta remove your equipment take the pad so there are certain things you and i can come to turn to to, to agreement with but there are certain things that the law won't allow us to convey uh, or to keep for ourselves okay one more if i may <clears throat> under the fee simple you <clears throat> i loved your analogy of heaven to hell yeah I mean, it, it assumes goes all the way down but Yet we have companies that have natural gas storage facilities deep under, and it may be under my land and I don't even know. So what rights or how far do my fee simple rights go? Well, statutes have intervened on this, both uh, below ground and above ground. So the, the classic case is you can't sue an airline for trespass for going over your property 30,000 feet. The Supreme Court decided that in 1946 that, you know, basically you've got a certain height and above that uh, you've got to uh, allow uh, people to cross it. This is a matter of, of state and federal statute about depths and other things. Okay. But keep in mind, since you raised it, the mineral owner, um, or let's just say the fee owner, let's keep this as simple as possible since you raised heaven to hell, You've got a whole section. You could have one person who is pumping oil and gas out of your property and you're the lessor and he's the lessee. You're going to have another part of your property where someone is storing natural gas in an underground cavity. Uh, you own that, but you're leasing it to the company that is uh, using the reservoir space to store the gas. Or you can just sell that reservoir space to the gas company. So, I mean... This can happen in many, many different ways. So does the company storing the gas in that reservoir cavity, they have to specifically know it's under my surface property and do they have to set up a lease or do they just do it? Or they, There are rules under the Kansas statutes for the, the location and the establishment of the, the gas reservoir 
And there are rules the Kansas Corporation Commission passed about reservoir pressure. They can only have so, such levels of pressure. Um, there have been gas companies that have not followed those statutes, and then there have been litigation about, you know, to the extent of those violations. Um, but that is, that is an area, the, the subsurface storage of pressurized gas, that is largely a creature of statute as well as common law. So that was a really good example of where you got to turn to the statutes first because they passed statutes that override the common law. Thank you. I appreciate you being here too. Representative Carmichael. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Professor Griggs, I really appreciate your presentation. It's been a good refresher. A couple of areas of inquiry with the chair's permission. Uh, first, could you explain to us what is meant by the term severance, but also discuss it in the context of severance taxes, what, what they mean? Wow, that's a good question. Um, severance, you've identified two different meanings, okay? The severance I have talked about is where we take a fee simple absolute, heaven to hell, and we sever something off of it. And the dominant hypothetical this morning was the mineral interest. That's where I have a severance of real property. You've got real property on the surface, you have real property in the mineral state. That's severance. Your question, second part, is about severance taxes. This is what an oil and gas company would pay when it's pumping oil and gas out of the ground when that oil and gas comes out of the ground, it is severed from the ground, and its property status changes. Again, through the miracle of property. You probably now, no one wants to go to law school at this point, because if I use the word miracle and property in the same sentence, you're going to throw something at me. You're the mineral estate owner. You pumped oil and gas out of the ground. When it was in the ground, it had the status of real property. When it came out of the ground, it became personal property. And you paid a severance tax on, you pumped, you know, 10 barrels out that day, you pay a severance per barrel uh, based on however that severance tax works. So yes, severance has two meanings and I appreciate the question. Then I think there's also taxation of unsevered mineral interests, but let's don't go down that road today. Uh, my second question though, Mr. Chair, with your permission, I guess we can do it as a hypothetical. I own an 80. The wealthy chair owns all the sections around me. There's a reservoir underneath both of us. I want to get in there and I want to suck that thing dry before the chair leases any of it so I can run off with the money. Pooling and unitization. Can you help us with some of those concepts? When do you have to adjourn? Okay. About three minutes. Um. Very quickly. You can't be prevented from developing your 80 based on the land baron of Ellsworth County over here. So even though the Kansas Corporation Commission may have spacing rules between wells to protect reservoir pressure, these were passed in the 1920s and the 1930s because the oil and gas industry regularly comes to the state begging for mercy to save itself from itself. Okay, and the royalty owners are not innocent in this, right? They want as many royalties too. So let's say you have two acres and you need 30 acres to put a well in, but you've only got two. Well, you may get an exception well. Um, you may be able to drill your own well, but do you want that? No, you don't want all that stuff on your property. So the representative talked about a pooling clause in the lease. A pooling clause would go as, as follows. I'm the oil and gas company. I lease the land baron's ground and your piddly little 80, okay? But the lease has a pooling clause, which means if I, the operator, decide to just drill on the land baron's property, but we know that the oil and gas is under your property too, you will get a share of proceeds proportional to your 80 under the terms of the lease. So a pooling clause is where you can have production for all the properties in an area, as long as they're all leased. If you're not leasing, you don't get the benefit of that pooling clause. But this is common where you have one lessee leasing four or five different properties or two or 300, right? And the pooling clause allows the operator to pool the overall proceeds from all of those leases 
and then distribute them according to acreage. Unitization is when the state steps in through a process of administrative hearings and declares a unit. It's basically pooling, but it's with the arm of the state. Further questions? I have one. Um, Professor, we, we've heard a lot this session and, and maybe over the last couple sessions about um, the, the leases that are, uh, that are being offered as part of wind exploration or solar exploration around the state. And the, the, the term of those leases is often 25 to 50 years, depending on, on uh, whether production occurs. Uh, in that sense, uh, that would be solar energy production. Um, can you speak to, we, we, have, we have, at least it's been argued that that's somehow different than the rights that, that are in play for a landowner um, with, with oil and gas. And I guess if you could just speak to the fact that an unsuspecting or unsophisticated landowner with any form of energy exploration or siting um, is at great risk if they, if they don't know their rights or take steps to find out their rights and maybe compare and contrast the time timelines and timetables involved. Well, I would share your concern that there are many Kansans out there who have the good fortune to own a lot of land or own land, uh, but may not have a sophisticated understanding of these conveyancing issues. They would have the same warning, you know, call 411, get a lawyer to apprise you of these things with an oil and gas lease would apply as well <clears throat> to a wind uh, or, or solar lease. Uh, beyond that, I'm hesitant to get too much in this because this is very much a moving target. Um, but I do want to raise something based on your question. You described a term lease. This is a lease that has an endpoint, 25 years, 30 years. Most oil and gas leases are held by production. So, you know, one thing to think about is should you, should you think about a term lease differently than you think about a, a classic oil and gas lease, which is conceivably infinite in duration. On behalf of the committee, we thank you very much for your time, for sharing your knowledge with us. Uh, and uh, we appreciate uh, all the work that you do at Washburn and here. There's done a lot of work on that bill. We were really going to be focusing on the fee provision of that bill, uh, not the front end of that bill. Currently, the bill provides for a 20 cent per line uh, fee, and I think it's a four cent per prepaid wireless uh, line fee to be collected to fund the operations uh, of that. I want to focus our inquiry kind of narrowly on the fee issue because that's the part that affects utilities. And then we'll talk about what we might do when we work that bill next week. The last bill will be Senate Bill 19. Senate Bill 19 is a, a body donor. Uh, my intention is that we are going to hear that bill for the purposes of gutting it and putting the 988 bill and whatever changes we make to it in that next Tuesday when we work bills. So don't be alarmed that we've suddenly wandered into transportation and health issues. Uh, we'll, we'll only wander uh, as far as our mandate goes. So. Uh, that's what we'll be working on for Thursday. Next week, we have a presentation from uh, Sherry Feist Albrecht on the Southwest Power Pool and how the, the state can be a little more involved in that. Uh, and then we'll work those bills. And then uh, last, that'll be our last week of action in the committee. So anything for the good of the order? Representative Turner. Those bills on Tuesday. That would be my intention. Just going to have a hearing on Thursday and then work them following Tuesday. Okay. It's a little bit unusual around here that we actually let something lie after a hearing. But yes, that's we're we're, we're going to do it old school. Uh, we're going to hear it, give you time to think about it, and give the revisor time to work on amendments, and then we'll work them next Tuesday. All right. Anything else? All right. With that, we're adjourned. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>